Thanks for sharing, guys. Um, let's go ahead and move to the first slide, the next slide, which is the first slide. Um, welcome to our Heat Pumps for Homes uh, webinar. And uh, this is part of a series of webinars. Um, it's the third in a series of webinars uh, for ambassadors, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But uh, I'm Melissa Birch. I'm with the Clean Energy Resource Teams, and I'm joined by Jacob Selseth and Heidi All, uh, who are going to be presenting on heat pumps today. So uh, next slide, please. So CERTS is a statewide partnership. Uh, we connect individuals and communities to resources. So it could be informational resources, uh, financial resources, connecting to other people. But whatever uh, communities need in order to identify and implement community-based clean energy projects. So we focus on energy efficiency and conservation, um, renewable energy, and uh, beneficial electrification. And so this is our heat pump uh, webinar is focused really on that beneficial electrification and efficiency pieces. Um, next slide, please. So we provide technical assistance, we provide financial assistance, small bits, but connect people to larger financial assistance whenever we can. And um, we work across Minnesota. So we have uh, regional coordinators around the state who um, are available to help communities move forward on clean energy projects. Next slide. One of our really exciting programs that at least we're really excited about, and it seems like other folks are as well, is our Community Energy Ambassadors Program. Next slide, please. This is an opportunity for folks out in community like yourselves to support your communities in um, doing clean energy projects. Next slide, please. And um, helping make sure that as that we engage in uh, the clean energy transition, that community voices are well informed and centered in community um, priorities. So um, next slide. And making sure that 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 the uh, clean energy transition is rooted in those needs and aspirations of communities. So this is uh, something that we have online self-paced training. This webinar is part of that. And we're covering a lot of different clean energy projects, one or clean energy topics. And once we um, once you've completed all of the topics, then you can identify a project that you'd like to do to assist your community with clean energy. And then you become a certified community energy ambassador. So um, we're looking forward to seeing folks progress through the training and do some projects and really help your communities move forward on clean energy. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Jake, who is going to talk about heat pumps and air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, um, and I will pass it off now. All right, thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, Heidi, if you want to go to the next slide, you kind of saw what we're going to be talking about today, heat pumps, heat pumps, heat pumps. And the idea will help finish up too at the end with, with how to pay for some of these things because there's fantastic incentives out there right now um, that, that she'll discuss. But a big question is, is, is why heat pumps? Um, you know, we're kind of growing up, if we're mostly Minnesotans, let's say we're kind of used to the, the gas furnace, whether it be propane, natural gas, or, or whatever we're using, maybe a boiler, maybe forced air. And we're kind of in this transition now where we have... Uh, different technologies that we can apply, and why is this heat pump such going to be such an important play such an important role and be such a good choice for us? So first of all, heat pumps should be saving consumers money in the long run. Uh, we can talk about this a little bit down the line as far as the different rates and things like that, but heat pumps in and of themselves are incredibly energy efficient, and so. 
by that virtue, they're going to be saving us some money. We do need to look a little deeper to make sure that on those economic choices, but I'll help you understand how to make good choices in that area. A nice part about they do enable better grid management. A heat pump, we'll get into this a little bit later, but we all, most of us will have a central air conditioner if we own a single family home or a small air conditioner in an apartment, whatnot, and, and uh, so on and so forth. Now to heat with electricity though, does require a lot of power, but a heat pump, essentially uses about the same amount of power as our existing equipment, like an air conditioner. So we don't need significant upgrades uh, or large electrical demand to, to utilize heat pumps, which makes grid management easier. And then the, finally, for reducing the negative environmental impacts, one of the cool things, we'll talk about this more as we go along, but with heat pumps, we're using energy from our environment, from the air, from the ground, wherever we're going to get that rather than from the fuel, from the electricity. We're literally using the energy from the environment rather than from the fuel. And so that right there, it is a bit of a no brainer. So we just gotta try to find the right mix. Next slide. So electrification, some of you have probably been starting to hear this buzzword. And actually I do wanna pause for just a second. I wanna say thank you for being ambassadors because uh, what we're doing right now, what we're seeing with funding and whatnot, this is a one of the biggest surges of money that's for homeowners, for, for us as individuals to apply to our own lives and save and 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 make good progress towards being utilizing more clean energy. We had a big surplus of money um, after the economic collapse in 2008, but a lot of that went to the utilities and we saw all the wind turbines coming up and so on and so forth. This big bundle of money is coming to us and it's a great way for us to become cleaner and, uh, and save some money. And the electrification is a big piece of that. We're used to kind of in Minnesota, I would say, using fossil fuels, the natural gas furnace, boiler, et cetera. Now we have this ability to electrify and use technologies better to uh, save energy in total and uh, and money as well, depending on, like, again, we wanna pay attention to rates and things like that, but great opportunities. Uh, so that's kind of electrification in a nutshell, maybe too quick, we can talk later. Next slide. So why heat pumps in Minnesota? This is, I love this little chart, you know, it's a little picture of a house and right on the bottom is you know, the majority of our energy dollars and our energy use comes from heating and air conditioning. Then you got some water heating, the, water, the appliances, lighting and electronics and so forth. But if you wanna save a lot of energy, start where the biggest piece of the pie is, right? That just makes sense. Now, if you look on the left there, there's about, oh, can you go back? There's 300 hours of cooling. Um, and right now we're gonna have a hot muggy day today, but there's 2000 hours of heating. And so a heat pump is gonna be able to address both of those things. And that heating hours at 2000 is obviously uh, the biggest chunk in why it's um, so important. Next slide. So just real quick, and this is kind of nice because I think heat pumps, they, they're they not very deep into the, into the marketplace right now. There's definitely some out there, they're having success. But it is kind of nice for us to understand what people are wondering about for heat pumps. So if you um, would like to um, answer in the chat, how much do you know about heat pumps? Do you feel very confident or at a five or, or one? And um, that gives us a good feel too for what is people's comfort level before we even kind of get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty. All right, so heat pumps go by many names. And what I want to do today is make things not confusing. So don't worry about reading this whole list. But a heat pump, they've been around forever. Essentially, we have your air conditioner in your home is a heat pump. Your refrigerator is a heat pump. It's the refrigeration cycle. We attach the word heat pump when that system can reverse its direction. So with your refrigerator, it's not creating cold. It's absorbing heat inside of the unit and rejecting it outside through that coil. Same thing with your air conditioner. 
Your air conditioner in your home does not create cold. It absorbs heat within your home and rejects it outside. The only difference with the heat pump is that has the ability to reverse its direction and now absorb heat, say, outside and bring it inside during, say, those 2,000 hours of, uh, of our heating season. Next slide. So here's a little look. Uh, there's kind of, we've been at CERT's been talking a lot about air source heat pumps over the last couple of years. And the two big ones that you'll probably hear talked about out in the field is the air source heat pump, which essentially is a replacement and upgrade, I would say, of your air conditioner, or the ground source heat pump, which um, uh, essentially the main difference is the air source uses the air as your form of heat exchange and the ground source uses the ground. Now, if you think about the ground, if you go below the frost line, the temperature of the ground is usually about 47 degrees uh, Fahrenheit steady, and there's a lot more thermal energy in ground than there is in air. So uh, that's just kind of a little foreshadowing on sort of the pros and cons of the two. Air source heat pumps, a little easier to entry point uh, to get to, and then the ground source heat pump a little bit more investment, but excellent technologies, uh, both of them. The next slide. So this is a little uh, uh, snapshot, and uh, it's, it's a little uh, pet project of mine, but it's a BTU. And all that is is heat. And heat pumps, what do they do? They move heat. An air conditioner moves heat from in your home, out of your home. Um, and believe it or not, a BTU is simply a unit, it's a unit of measurement. One wooden matchstick is a BTU. Uh, it's also the same as a, as a candle power. One, so it's candlelight and lumens and all that. So it's, it's kind of a little bit of trivia here, but you're going to end up on a trivia piece. And then a kilowatt hour of energy, which a kilowatt hour, as you probably already know, is, is how they, you know, build residential electricity. There is... Just plain and simple, 3,413 BTUs in the kilowatt hour, or 3,413 matchsticks. So just to kind of maybe put our heads around it just a tiny bit. Next slide. So I think we're all very familiar uh, with the electric space heater. And I think we kind of know that they're pretty good, you know, like if you got the cold feet in the office or you have that kind of uh, spot in your home that just needs a little extra boost. That's kind of their wheelhouse. Most space heaters that you buy in the store are sized for your outlets in your home. So just to plug it into the into your outlet, and that makes them by virtue of that 1,000 watts, maybe 1,500 watts. Those are the kind of two main heater sizes. And so what that means here, if you look on the left, is you get 3,400 BTUs out of that electric space heater. You get a kilowatt hours worth of heat in, a kilowatt hours worth of heat out. This, I think is, I think this is the most important slide right here. With the heat pump, the magic of the heat pump is for that same kilowatt hour in, you get two and three times the amount of kilowatt hours, kilowatt hours out in heat. So 3,400 BTUs in equals 9,000 BTUs out. Now there are caveats because it depends on well how what how warm the day is and all those kind of things, but essentially you are looking at doubling and tripling the amount of heat out than you put than the energy in, and that's kind of getting that getting your energy like I referenced earlier from your environment rather than from your fuel. Next slide. So air source heat pumps. Let's kind of focus on those a little bit right now. So I kind of mentioned this earlier, it's an AC that operates in reverse. They efficiently heat and cool with electricity. Again, heat pumps are moving heat. The air conditioning uh, is literally absorbing heat from within your home and rejecting it outside. In the wintertime, <clears throat> the heat pump absorbs heat outside even. It works very well. Um, you're looking at 300% efficiencies. Um, say in the, like a 45 degree day, 250% efficient in a 32 degree day. And believe it or not, in Minnesota, we get very cold, but the average temperature for most of Minnesota in the winter is 32 degrees 
uh, Fahrenheit. So heat pumps work a lot. I would say you probably would expect about a thousand hours of heat pump operation, maybe 1200, depending on which type you get. And we'll talk more about that later, but uh, they work very well. And the efficiencies just kind of go down as it gets colder. And depending on the technology, you might be running your heat pump down to 20 degrees, or if you have, we'll talk about cold climate heat pumps, maybe down to five degrees or potentially zero, but um, um, we don't want to get too caught up in, in all those specifics. Next slide. So even as cold air has heat to give, it does just get a little bit more challenging as it gets colder. Um, the magic of the refrigeration cycle, and we're not going to get into this, but uh, one thing with the BTU, it's just simply the amount of energy to raise one pound of water. So like this glass of water, one pound of water, I'll look, drink some of it, so 16 ounces, uh, to raise this one degree Fahrenheit. What, uh, what the refrigeration cycle does is it actually uh, leverages um, turning this water, let's say, or the refrigerant into steam. And to make that change, that same one degree change from 212 water to 212 steam is 970 BTUs. So not one, but 970. And that's how that heat pump, the magic, is able to absorb so much heat from air, so much heat from ground, and move it to where we want it. Next slide. Yeah, and you know, if you look at this, this is the same as we're used to. It looks just like the outdoor unit, the condensing unit of an air conditioner. Uh, the main difference it'll visually will be it's on a stand, which is essentially to keep it out of the snow because we get a lot of snow here, of course. Uh, the refrigerant lines, um, basically you got a liquid and vapor line. That's kind of what I just alluded to a little bit there. And then the indoor unit, that green circle, uh, and you see this on, with your air conditioning system, that's typically called the A-coil. And so that's just the um, kind of the same system as it is outside. It's absorbing heat uh, as the furnace blows air across that A-coil and then uh, transfers it outside and then reverses that process in the wintertime using that refrigeration cycle to really maximize that ability to transfer heat. It's, it's quite impressive, really. But not new technology. We've been using it, just not necessarily actively in this application. Not new technology, just much improved application. Next slide. Now, when we're talking air source heat pumps, there are the two main types, the ductless or mini split, and then the central system or the ducted system. So, um, and, the, and that really just kind of depends on what you have in your situation. Are you building a single family home and you're gonna have a forest air furnace and so you're gonna have duct work? Well, then you pretty much wanna go with that central ducted system. Uh, are you, do you want warm floors? A lot of people build say a slab on grade home or something like that and they're not gonna have duct work then you're a perfect application for a ductless mini split. Or you have, I lived in the city for a long time, we had the boiler with the radiators, no duct work. But you, know, you see these window air conditioners and things, the ductless mini split is such a nice way to deliver heating and cooling with a heat pump. They are incredibly energy efficient. They have an advantage of not having any uh, losses, say through the duct work and uh, just very kind of tight uh, controlled system. So highly efficient, uh, as are the ducted systems. Probably slightly less efficient, but able to really heat and cool an entire you know, space home. So that's kind of the main thing. The other kind of nice part about a ductless is you think of like a window unit, like a window AC or something like that. You know, it takes up a spot on your wall. The, the mini splits, really all you're doing is through the home or apartment or town home, you're just kind of putting the, the refrigerant line set through the wall. So it's less penetration into the building as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's see here. Okay, this just kind of refers a little bit to, you'll see them on a stand, uh, the snow depth, 
I did want to add one thing uh, with the mini splits. There'll usually be that condensing unit outside and oftentimes maybe just one indoor unit, but they really do go up pretty commonly up to four indoor units. So you could have four uh, interior spaces uh, heated and cooled off of one condensing unit. And all those kind of answers will be uh, decided sort of based on everyone's individual uh, situation. But it's good to be aware uh, that, that those options exist. Next slide. So just kind of a little bit to what we already talked about. So with the mini split systems, you can have the zoned heating. That's sort of those four head units. That's the picture in the lower right. So you could have up to four of those. And technology changes. Maybe somebody's got a unit that can do five, or but you can definitely do two and three and, and four. Very energy efficient, no duct work. Great fits when you have the boiler system, you know, the radiators in floor, as I mentioned, electric baseboard, things of that nature. And then it just does a great job of air conditioning as well. So kind of a wild range of costs I see we have here, 3000 to $18,000. And I wish the world wasn't this way, but they're not relatively expensive pieces of equipment, but it does seem that uh, pricing can be sporadic. So uh, getting multiple bids is always a, a good idea. So uh, next slide. And then here's that central. See, it looks just like your central system. There it is up on legs. Uh, you always want to make sure these are kind of level. That's good for the for the compressors. But you want it with the existing ductwork uh, furnace fan, and it operates as your AC and heating. Um, let's see. And then one thing I would say with kind of both of these systems, but maybe this more in particular, think of getting an air source heat pump more as an incremental cost. If you want to get into the heat pump game, you need an air conditioner. Say, you know, it's 20 years old. The thing just isn't quite doing the job anymore. The new air conditioner is going to be $3,000, you know, for your 14 seer or 16 seer air conditioner. Think of it as that incremental cost. You are going to have to spend probably an extra $1,500, $2,000, you know, over that air conditioner. But the energy savings then you get now, instead of over 300 hours in the, for trying to save on your air conditioning bill, now we can save on our heating bill as well, uh, get all those energy, clean energy benefits. And, uh, and it's kind of nice to think of it in that incremental cost. It's just the upgrade to the air conditioner rather than, you know, trying to save that whole big chunk. Because I think like a day like today, we all like our air conditioning. So next slide. And there's just the two main, the standard, which is single stage. There are some two stage, uh, and that's essentially a little bit alluding to the cold climate. You want your heat pump, air source heat pump, to be a good air conditioner first. And to be a good air conditioner, you need to be appropriately sized to get rid of humidity. If you're an oversized air conditioner, it's gonna take heat out too quick, not get the moisture out of the air, and you're gonna kind of have that cool, damp feeling. So you have to make sure that your air conditioner runs as it should. Now a variable speed and a technology out there is called an inverter uh, driven compressor. Um, variable speed is kind of your best of both worlds. It's gonna be a great air conditioner for you. Run at, the, at a lower power level, um, dehumidify the way we want, and then uh, be able to ramp up its power level and absorb more heat in the winter time. And this one would be kind of into your cold climate heat pump where maybe now we can start running it down to five degrees or maybe even zero degrees. Um, it's uh, kind of the sizing will dictate that. But be aware that the Minnesota heating season when you size a heating and cooling system, for heating we do size for uh, I believe it's 20 degrees below. So we really don't want to get caught up in cold climate. Is Don't think of that as like it's going to take care of everything. You're going to need another source of heat if we go air source heat pump. And that really shouldn't. It's kind of like having a hybrid electric vehicle. You know, you can go farther. Don't have to worry. You know, it's kind of a little bit of a choice and maybe it costs a little bit less. 
And same situation here. Next slide. And so, yeah, I kind of jumped ahead, but that's essentially your cold climate. So that variable speed, which is nice, it can run a little slower, a little less power, do the great job air conditioning, then ramp up, go a little harder, and get you some great heating, say down to, here it says like five degrees. And, and that does, that's a really good number that you should be able to kind of count on. But again, it sort of every house is going to be a little bit different with sizing and you know, are you out in the wind or sun and, and all those kind of fun things. But uh, but yeah, excellent. And it's kind of amazing that your air conditioner heat pump, you know, can heat your home <laughs> with that cold air. And uh, that is the magic of the refrigeration uh, cycle. So next slide. Uh, so yeah, now here, I really like, I'm a devil's in the details guy. But uh, electric resistance heat is kind of, generally speaking, your most expensive. There's different rates and things you can try to get on depending on who your utility is. We're happy to talk about that at a later date. But you're looking at 55% savings easy over electric uh, resistance heat. You will need some additional heat, of course, uh, for those coldest days of the year. And then uh, also very competitive. Propane prices do tend to change, but... Uh, you know, the really cheap, maybe a summer rate propane is like a buck 20, but then you're filling up at a buck 80 in the winter and uh, heat pumps pretty much got you beat all the time, uh, especially depending on rates. And we can kind of dig into that at another time, but you're looking at uh, still solid, you know, 30% savings uh, there. Uh, next slide. And then with natural gas, it's kind of a little bit the same. Natural gas doesn't vary as much as propane. Uh, it's sold usually by the CCF or Therm. Uh, I have center point energy myself. And last year it would have been like 80 cents up to a buck 20, just sort of depending on the month and, and polar vortexes and all those other kind of things. Electric rates are very stable where all the other fuels tend to, to vary. Natural gas being more stable than say propane, but, uh, but natural gas is a very, generally speaking, low cost fuel. And uh, depending on the electric rate, um, depends on how close or competitive the heat pump is uh, to heating with uh, with your natural gas furnace. Now, one thing I didn't say earlier though, anytime you're using fuel, the natural gas furnace, if you have, you're bringing, you know, 100% of the fuel in, you're only getting 90% out or 80% out of the heat. So you're always getting those BTUs from the fuel. And this is, depends on how efficiently you can do that. Where with the heat pumps, you are getting the majority of your heat of your BTUs from the environment, not from the fuel. Uh, there is no way to kind of go net zero, you know, with a fossil fuel appliance. Uh, ground source heat pump would be kind of one of your best tools if you were had that as a goal. That's not necessarily a goal that we have for you, but that would be um, the route you would probably look. Uh, next slide. So what's kind of cool about heat pumps is they can be applied in a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways. Uh, heat pump clothes dryers, which honestly I probably have the least amount of experience with, uh, but again, it's using that same technology, absorbing that heat from within uh, your clothing and whatnot and rejecting, you know, pulling the moisture out and, and rejecting that outside. Uh, I have the least amount of experience with the heat pump clothes dryers but it's just using the same technology in a different application and it's, you know, it's proven technology and, um, and, and highly energy efficient. So uh, next slide. Heat pump water heaters. I do have a lot of experience with these. Uh, these have been very popular. I think we're still kind of, people are kind of getting comfortable with them, but I right now have, we have a lot of things in our basement. We got, old you know jackets and kids toys and all that stuff and so i run a dehumidifier in my basement and i think the simplest way to describe an air source heat pump is that you have a dehumidifier which is a heat pump that uses the there's a little compressor there and it rejects the heat into the water heater heat pump water heaters are the only energy star rated water heaters uh, they have a 2.0 or higher uh, co efficiency 
A word I haven't really talked about is coefficient of performance, the COP. And that's the number that you'll kind of see out there. I don't think we have a lot of it in the slides, but um, a little bit of that technical jargon on how we uh, describe the efficiencies. But again, so it's the only Energy Star rated electric water heater. Think of it as a dehumidifier that, so I mean, it's kind of nice. You'll get some dehumidification. Uh, they're not set, you know, to, to satisfy some requirement of your basement, but, uh, but you'll get those benefits. And then uh, what you really want is you want a, a thousand, like here it says a thousand cubic feet of air uh, to draw from, to, to pull that heat. Um, and uh, they work really well. I think uh, depending on your application and situation, I look forward to getting one of these in my own home. I haven't done it yet, but the incentives are fantastic and my water heater's getting old. I have an atmospheric water heater and this is gonna be a perfect fit uh, for me, so. Uh, any questions on those? But otherwise, next slide. And we'll take all kinds of questions, any ones you have as we uh, uh, as we kind of complete the presentation. So again, uh, when I kind of look backwards, I've worked a lot with utilities and whatnot, uh, cooperatives in particular. We did a ton of air source heat pumps, believe it or not, from like the years say 2002 to 2007. And when the home bubble burst, a lot of that kind of went away. But we had great electric rates. Gas prices actually got pretty darn high. And it was a no-brainer to put in an air source heat pump. Uh, people are doing it now. And probably economically, it's it's a fine decision, not a no-brainer like kind of in those old co-op days that I did. But uh, people are doing it. And that clean energy advantage of getting the BTUs from your environment rather than from the fuel, I mean, I think that speaks a lot. And, uh, and then we have stories to that and on, our, on our search homepage. We work with people all the time and, and they've been happy with them. You know, they do heat a little bit differently. Um, they're gonna cycle a little longer. You know, your heat's gonna probably come out a little cooler in an air source heat pump out of your vents, but stay running for longer. So your temperatures will be the same. And, um, you know, and we just hear about different people's experiences and and it's, you know, a way to decarbonize and, and it is a way to save money. We just want to make sure we utilize all the rebates and try to take advantage of as many rate options, discounts as we can. Uh, next slide. So now I'll try to go quick through ground source. Am I doing okay on time? Everybody's on a picture, so I'm just going to assume I'm doing okay on time. Doing great. Uh, Doing great, excellent. So now for geo. Uh, next slide. So you know most people probably will call it a ground source heat pump, geothermal, which is just earth, right? And uh, it's just essentially, and again, it's utilizing that same exact technology. It's utilizing the refrigeration, the refrigerant cycle, the compressor, absorbing heat for air conditioning in this case. Uh, inside of a single family home and rejecting it now, not out on a central air conditioning unit condenser, but it's using literally the earth. It's rejecting that heat into the ground. Then of course, winter time comes along and now it reverses that cycle, starts to absorb heat from the ground. Again, I kind of mentioned below the frost line, you're looking at 47 uh, degrees is I think pretty typical. And so that's usually commonly what folks will try to do. Um, but the big thing is, it's just that means of heat transfer. Here we're using the ground. Um, I know up in Maple Grove, um, Great River Energy has a huge heat, geothermal heat pump system, and they utilize a pond, their loop field. If you look at that horizontal loop field in the lower uh, right corner there, uh, the GRE system has a loop field just like that in, in the uh, drainage pond behind the building there. And they do all of their heating and cooling uh, with that system. So there's just different ways to do it. Uh, that one on the lower right is called horizontal. Um, a lot of times you might hear uh, it's called the slinky system. And it literally does kind of look like a slinky, that old child's toy, and, and it gets stretched out. Uh, that's, that's a very popular uh, application. You do need a little bit more uh, space to do something like that. But if say if you're building a home, 
it's pretty easy. You know, the guys usually have the excavators there and, and they dig it down. They spread out the, the slinky and then bury it and away they go. If you're more, say, maybe suburban, then you're kind of looking more at a vertical loop field. And it's kind of a neat little adaption here, a diagonal. I don't know. I personally haven't seen those as much, but that's kind of a cool concept. But uh, so the those vertical loops, um, they're very sim similar to like uh, when you get a well uh, drilled at a home. Uh, they usually go about 150 to 200 feet deep. And usually each uh, vertical loop is about a ton worth of uh, heating and cooling is essentially what they're going for. Sizing is incredibly important with ground source heat pumps. Uh, different dirt types, you know, you have clay, you have sand, dry, wet, whatever, makes a big difference. Ground source heat pumps work awesome when they're sized correctly. Anytime it seems like you run into like, oh man, that thing isn't doing its job. Unfortunately, uh, there's a test called the soil conductivity test. And you really want to just make sure that you've got things properly sized. Otherwise, they are very energy efficient. If the air source heat pump is 250% efficient or 2.5 COP, the geo is going to be kind of 350% uh, efficient generally, uh, or 3.5. And the geo, because we're taking it from the ground, can carry, can carry your entire home for heating and cooling. You don't need a backup system. Now, sometimes you might be on a certain type of rate or something like that that might want you to be on a backup, but you don't have to have one uh, on geo. You will have to have one on air source. So it's kind of like that all electric vehicle is the geo and the hybrid, you know, the Toyota Prius, which are awesome cars, is the is the air source. So next slide. And this is kind of a nice picture. So here's kind of a this is actually almost another, um, this is sort of like that horizontal system instead of a big square, they just did a really long trench. So you really can customize it to your application. And sometimes you're customizing it to, does your installer have you know, a, well, a well driller? Is that kind of their forte? Or do they kind of have the bulldozer where they kind of like to excavate? Uh, here they got, they're trenching. So it doesn't really matter as long as you size it correctly. Here you're kind of looking at the soil. What is your soil type? How deep are you going? How much feet of loop? Nothing you need to worry about yourselves, but definitely need to be asking those kind of questions when you are, um, say, looking at bids and, and one comes in significantly cheaper. Like, well, are they not giving me as much? Or, you know, understanding those things. And that's kind of what we can do, hopefully, at certs is help you answer questions like that. And, and maybe ask the right questions, might even be better said. So very energy efficient. The costs unfortunately do kind of range because the applications range and, um, and we just never, you know, it'd be great. There's great installers out there, but I don't know if there's always a steady stream of customers. So that just all those things kind of impact things, unfortunately, a lot of variables, uh, size, uh, location considerations, all that, but, uh, but excellent technology. And, uh, I always kind of wish that we would do centralized loop fields, like have a little park centralized loop field, and then, uh, send the heat pumps into the inv individual town homes or single family homes. These, you know, they're planned neighborhoods anyway, but, um, that's just a little pipe dream for me, but it's, it's certainly doable and plausible. All right. Off the soapbox. Next slide. Uh, what do we got here? So we kind of kick back a little bit to the BTUs in, BTUs out. And I, so the same thing, I kind of alluded to this already. You've got a thousand watt space heater, you get a thousand watts of heat out of that. Uh, that's a little plug in space heater. You know, if you were going to try to heat your whole home with a space heater with electric resistance, a lot of times you're literally using like an entire service, like a 200 amp service. So to go electric space heat, you know, it's just not, it, it's done sometimes, but it's not the most practical, but you get a thousand in a thousand out, hundred percent efficient. That sounds really good, but you know, it has its caveats. Ground source, thousand watts of, of heat pump going in, 
you're getting uh, 3,500 watts of, of heat coming out. So that 3,400 BTUs of heat going in, you're getting nearly 12,000. And that's pretty steady because the ground is constant. Air source, you've got some variability because some days are mild, some days are cold. The efficiency varies based on that. And we take some good averages and we get we figure all that information out for you. But the ground, very steady, properly sized. You're rocking 350% efficient, uh, more or less all the time. Uh, and of course, caveat just for, you know, system sizing and all those kind of things, but, but very good. That's the... Um, the nature of that technology. So yeah, I hope that's, if there's one piece, triple the BTUs out that you put in, energy from your environment rather than from your fuel. Uh, next slide. All right. Uh, I hope I did an all right job for you guys helping explain heat pumps. Uh, the great next step Heidi has for you out there is Excellent incentives for helping pay for these um, through utilities and, and taxes and things like that. So thank you very much for your time and thanks for being ambassadors. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so I will talk a little bit about paying for your projects. And as I go through that, if you have any questions that you want to put in the chat, um, we can have some time at the end to answer those too. So the first step always in any project in your home is making sure that you tighten it up and you insulate it to make sure that it's as weatherized as possible before you install any new systems could because the efficiency of the system does also affect on how many how many leaks you have in your home. Um, checking your electric utility for rebates is important. One thing right now that's available for a lot of utilities are heat pump incentives. There are more coming out through the state um, throughout this year, but for right now, a lot of utilities already have those available. And you also want to make sure that you get bids from skilled contractors uh, and keep the federal and state incentives in mind. To find a contractor, the AirSort Heat Pump Collaborative has, is a great resource for all things heat pumps, but also they have a contractor network um, that is vetted and they do a great job keeping that, their list up to date and who you can find for a licensed contractor. Rebates that are coming soon, um, hopefully by the end of this year from the state include heat pumps. There's other electrification rebates too, but um, heat pump clothes dryers, heat pump water heaters, heat pump heating and cooling systems. Those will all be coming depending on your area meeting income and how much you will get back for that. And then the Department of Commerce has some energy programs coming up soon too. The heat pump rebate program is hopefully going to roll out um, later this summer, later this year. And that's up to $4,000 for your heat pump rebate. And so, like I said too, the utilities have a lot of incentives. Some of them are based by ton of units. Some are a flat rate of rebate. So it depends on the size of your system. And so like Jake said too, make sure it's sized correctly. Um, there are rebates specifically on ground source and air source heat pumps, depending on your utility. And Minnesota will have residential rebates available for residents potentially later this year, hopefully. If you want more information, um, the QR code will send you right to our website for more info. Um, we can call out some questions in the chat, Maggie. We have someone from the Air Source Heat Collaborative in our midst. Thank you so much, Robbie. And sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, so some direct links there, and we can see their logo has been in some of these slides as well. So thank you for that. We know that was a lot of information, but if you want to go ahead and start putting questions in the chat, that's great. If you prefer to unmute, you can do the little raise your hand thing and um we can do that too. Robbie, go ahead. Hi, sorry. I hope this isn't uh, annoying. I thought I'd just chime in uh, to be helpful on just the timing um, item. 
there was a recent meeting that the Department of Commerce hosted uh, that I actually wasn't able to attend, but did see the slides from and the timelines that I saw for the rollout of the homes and here programs identified that those might be available to customers potentially in spring 2025. So I just uh, we're, we're trying not to under or trying not to over promise timing. Everybody's really excited to have those roll out. And I just wanted to uh, bring that up uh, to hopefully add some clarity there. Thanks, Robbie. Appreciate that. Jacob, there is a longer question in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead if for anyone who might be reading the, uh, excuse me, um, listening to the recording, I'll read it a bit. Uh, and then Jake or Jacob, if you don't mind responding. So Jacob indicated that running an air source heat pump costs more than heating with natural gas. Do the economics change when you produce your own energy via rooftop solar electricity, uh, your own electricity via rooftop solar? Also, do the rebates make the total cost of an air source heat pump system, equipment purchase and energy cost cheaper than sticking with natural gas? Jacob, you want to address that? Sure. I think um, there's always all these kind of it depends type answers. Um, heat pumps, so air source heat pumps are pretty darn competitive head-to-head uh, -head with natural gas. Um, I kind of like to look at um, sort of like a daily cost. And with natural gas, say you have a 90% efficient furnace and you paid about a dollar for your CCF, uh, in gas, that's about ten dollars uh, per day of heat. That's a million BTU, so it's about ten bucks a day. If you have an air source heat pump at that two hundred and fifty percent efficiency, and you would be well at thirteen cents, yeah, you're probably looking at like thirteen dollars a day. So, so the natural gas at those at that price comparison does beat it. So it's kind of um. You know, it's a little sticky wicket there. You do tend to always beat it against propane and some of the other fuels, but um, but you are sitting there. Now, if you have uh, solar panels, you know, and now you're selling back uh, through net metering, uh, then you know you are you are gaining an advantage there through your solar. And then it's just kind of how you decide you want to look at those economics. You know, are you going to use that electricity as a net benefit through the metering? or you know into you know get, utilizing those uh btus from the environment with the heat pump and so i think that's kind of a little bit more of, of how you kind of want to look at spending or utilizing uh that solar benefit so and robbie maybe you want to take a little better crack at that one but um that would be maybe an initial thought on that uh yeah i'm happy to chime in i think the solar item is complicated because um, there are some different incentives depending on the utility territory and it's kind of a sort of a separate investment um, so yeah I think once that investment is paid off um, then it can be considered a lower price per kilowatt hour and it can be more competitive that way um, as you've been saying when comparing efficiencies and um, so it really does depend on if those incentives are available, for example, Excel has the solar rewards program uh, and um, not every utility in the state necessarily has that available. So it might be just net metering, uh, which would be basically the wholesale cost of electricity uh, to, to be uh, that credit. So um, yeah, it is a kind of depend situation I posted a link to the, our cost of heat comparison resource. That is something we're going to be updating uh, later this summer. Uh, we're doing a round of rates research right now to uh, inform that tool. It does have a drop down for the electric utility and region fuel type, and then what type of electric rate also matters. So a lot of cooperatives have dual fuel electric rates. If those are feasible with the product, that could be also a useful way to make that heat pump uh, more economical, uh, even compared to natural gas in some cases, uh, like in um, some of the service territories around the metro, for example, like Connexus, right, Hennepin, uh, Dakota Electric, those all offer dual fuel electric rates, which are really beneficial, and Excel Energy offers an electric space heating rate, which is also uh, really useful, um, but still, it's, it's a little tricky with natural gas, so 
we try to focus, as Jacob pointed out, on the um, the other added value proposition items that um, are received as benefits uh, when getting a heat pump versus just cost savings, which is usually an easier sell for those heating with propane or uh, electricity. Thanks, Robbie. There's another question in the chat that hasn't been answered yet, so I'm going to read that one aloud. Uh, I have central air conditioning. Can my system be easily converted to an air source heat system, heating and cooling system, using the existing refrigerant lines? So can we go from AC to ASHP? Uh, Jacob, you want to take it first? Uh, any thoughts on that one? I would say um, yes. Although if you're getting an entirely new system, they probably will uh, utilize new refrigerant lines, but they're essentially the same size. <clears throat> so there's no major change there. Um, whether they de determine they need to run new lines probably depends more on the age of your overall system. You know, if you have an old air conditioner, they'll probably just replace. They're going to need to replace the coil that sits above your furnace. That was the A coil I mentioned and the condensing unit outside. And whether or not they need a new set of lines would be kind of determined on a case by case. But it wouldn't be probably a piece that would drive your decision because that's not, you know, it is uh, a length of copper, of course. So there's some expense and labor with that, but it's not a large piece of the um, cost equation. So thanks, Jacob. And then as an uh, accessibility thing for us and for the recording, I'm going to read. A question and an answer uh, from our chat. We have a home built in 2004 with a 97% efficient natural gas forced air furnace. Our AC still works well, but likely doesn't have much time left. It sounds like just replacing the AC is the eh, help uh, is the better option when the time comes. What are your thoughts? Melissa Birch, who is the co-director, a co-director, we have three of certs, says there are still benefits with going to a air source heat pump to replace the air conditioning, focusing on more efficient cooling from the air source heat pump, and then shoulder season heating is available. Robbie added a new furnace could be beneficial because the fan would be much more energy efficient. PSC versus ECM in newer models. So new furnace and air source heat pumps, says Robbie from the Minnesota Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative. Um, Jacob, did you have an, is there Anything you wanted to add on that question? You don't have to, but just saying if you want to. No, I think uh, they're all right on the money. I'd like to remind just kind of that it's the incremental cost that we'd be you'd want you to hopefully look at in the savings, not that whole new system. There will be a time you need a new system. You know, you're 20 years old now. In the next five years, you know, you probably want to start considering that, but it sounds like you had very efficient technology. And then, uh, and then definitely just be paying attention to the rate structures because like a dual fuel rate of say six cents, which is out there, you know, then you're winning again. So on an economic point, you're winning and on an environmental uh, perspective, uh, you're winning. And, um, and there's other caveats in there too, as far as our grid keeps getting greener and all those kind of fun things. And if you had your own solar panels, so there's always a lot to consider, but this is a great technology worth exploring, uh, but also being, you know, eyes wide open. And thinking that vein of looking forward, uh, there's a couple of questions. I'm going to do one at a time. How quickly are you seeing costs drop for air source heat pumps and HP water heater technology? And this person has been getting this question a lot from residents. Jacob, you want to? Well, I answer? wish I had a better answer for air source heat pump because I think we need to continue training contractors uh, on this technology. We had a lot of luck in the early 2000s, as I mentioned. We had a couple of contractors. Uh, this was in Dakota Electric Service Territory, and they were excellent with them and very cost competitive. And so we kind of need the marketplace to do that again. And, uh, and I think we're working really hard to try to make that happen. I'm very happy with heat pump water heaters. You can go and get those at, you know, your Menards, Home Depots and whatnot for about probably, I hope I'm right on this, like about $1,500. And, um, you know, that would not be installed. And so, but that's a pretty decent uh, cost competitive price, in my opinion, 
for you know a highly efficient uh, system. I do think with the water heaters, I do want to warn folks. You know, if you have a livable basement and whatnot, uh, they do take heat from the environment, and so you want to make sure that there's enough space and um, and and keep uh, be aware of that as well. So. And then there's a question looking forward on the technology front. How rapidly is the technology improving? E.g., are we likely to see cold climate heat pumps that work efficiently down to the negative teens within the next couple of years? And I'll say uh, Robbie of the Minnesota Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative answered the question in the chat of the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy cold climate heat pump challenge products will be rolling out this winter and into the next year. This is a new class of products. Um, so, I mean, goodness. There's another question, Jacob. So I'm gonna read that one and then you can answer, you know, add on if you like. How long would it take to recoup the cost difference between replacing an AC versus an ASHP, air source heat pump? Well, I'm gonna try to make this pretty simple. Um, if you are on cooperative lines and have a good off-peak rate and kind of wander down that path, there's a very good, uh, there's good savings there to help pay off that difference. Um, if you're on kind of straight electric rate uh, against natural gas, uh, it's harder to calculate exactly when that would happen because Gas prices are variable, and I wish I could get you a straight answer, but I just can't. But I do think when you have uh, the rate incentives and the efficiencies, you know, the incremental cost, you know, hopefully you're going to be paying that off within, you know, not too long a period of time. I don't even really want to throw a number out, but, you know, it would be multiple years, but well within life of system, all those kind of things. Um, but um uh, but a little trickier to answer with conventional rates and things like that. So it is, there's a lot of moving parts and um, I wish I could give you a little straighter answer um, on that. All right, we are just about at one o'clock. Um, so I wanted to take a, a moment he here to just say thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today and thanks to our presenters today. Um, we will be sending out a survey and if you are looking to work toward getting that certified ambassador, community energy ambassador um, designation, um, be sure to fill out the survey so that we can record your participation in the workshop. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out at any time. Thanks so much, everybody.